The cycle of life is a truly fascinating concept, isn't it? First comes darkness, unable to see what is holding you back from achieving your true potential. However, as the darkness becomes your ally, your friend, your companion, it is suddenly ripped away from you as light penetrates the blanket you had clinged to for so long and you are forced out into a new world. This would mark the beginning to your story now that the darkness that had held you back for so long is gone, allowing you to learn and find your way in this world in achieving whatever you may wish, whether that be a family, a career, a community, a position of power or to merely be remembered for your time in this plane of existence. However, that darkness that had held you for all those years within its grasp, holding you tightly, would lie in wait, watching you in all of your glory for the chance to rip you away from the light and into an internal night, as death overtakes the life you held so dear. However, how did you come to be in this world, this universe, this endless plane of existence? Within the darkness of the universe, an explosion would appear from nowhere. Scientists would call this the Big Bang event, which had blessed the universe with light, giving birth to new worlds, which, in return, those worlds would breathe new life into existence. However, what if I told you that in this universe, the species that would inhabit these beautiful and rich planets did not come to be there on their own and were created by a higher power instead? That is where this story begins with a species known as the Precursors that would breathe life into existence only for that life to rise up and destroy them, only for them to return, but not as they were, but as a corrupted and perverted version of themselves, mutating into a parasitic life form that sought to dominate the life they had brought into the universe, dominating and twisting their forms to the collective of one species. And the species that had rose up against them saw only one way to save this universe from becoming a hollow shell, becoming a dead space, if you will. This decision would allow the life that had been snuffed out to begin again within their absence. Welcome to the history of the ancient times and all of the conflicts that had happened within this era. Five hundred million years ago, the species known as the Precursors would enter the galaxy known to be the Milky Way. The Precursors were transcendent beings who existed on a level beyond any conventional biological organism. These creatures were not bound to only one physical form, but many. They would possess the ability to transform into other shapes and sizes to their own likings. Perhaps the Bible story of Moses would speak some truth to this, as a precursor could have gone to him in the form of a burning bush, with the flames present but not bringing harm to the plant. Over the generations they would allow themselves to die and to be reborn again and again, reshaping into a new form, or forms. 
The precursors were incredibly gifted with hyper advanced technological capabilities and were spacefaring, able to travel throughout the universe or perhaps universes beyond. Who knows how far they would be prepared to go in their exploration of reality. These creatures also held a philosophy, a concept of a mantle and of living time, which was a concept of the flow of time and life's interaction with the cosmos. The mantle would come to have many different interpretations throughout the centuries, however it always came with the message of responsibility. They would also possess tremendous knowledge of neural physics, which allowed them the ability to manipulate the fabric of reality itself. 485 million years later, the precursors would travel to distant worlds all over the universe to see life as part of an experiment to enrich the universe with the forerunners being the first species to be born within the Milky Way and the humans to set out on Earth to be the second species. The precursors stewardship for the life they brought forth involved the belief that all experience of biological organisms enriched the greater universal whole something they themselves had experienced in their time firsthand through their constant changes to their many forms. As the life they were seeding was beginning to take their first steps on the soil of their new worlds, the precursors would begin building a database known as the Domain to contain the vast knowledge of information along with their experiences which would be a transcendent quantum reservoir of information. The precursors were not strictly benevolent, but were more realists in the topics of pain, suffering and strife, along with the many evils that could present itself to the species of this universe, holding the firm belief that the universe itself had a will of its own, that it was a living, breathing entity. The struggles of good and evil, the pleasures and pains of life, would add to the flavor of life, as without pain, pleasure would be meaningless, and without the struggle between good and evil, then important lessons would not be learned. It was indeed a necessary evil to allow these things to plague the life they seed with. The precursors would be successful in seeding the Milky Way with a diverse array of life, in hopes that one day, they would become new tools and companions to them over time. They would also judge whether a species was worthy of holding the mantle. The assumed position for the species was to be responsibility for all life, guardianship if you will. Centuries would pass and the forerunners would quickly rise through the ages, becoming a larger and stronger force. Becoming technologically advanced compared to the other species, besides their creators on their native world of Gebab, the Forerunners would eventually become aware of the humans on Earth and would see them as unworthy of their time, saw humanity to be inferior in comparison to themselves. The Precursors saw that the time was now to judge the Forerunners to see if their struggles were in vain or if they could be worthy of becoming the ones to guard all life, to protect the essence of the universe and all the mantles stood for. However, the precursors would judge the forerunners to be unworthy of such a divine status and the consequences would be dire for the forerunners as they would plan to exterminate the forerunners, wiping them from existence for their failings. The precursors would then look to humanity within 10 million BCE to fill the vacant position to judge if they could be worthy of the mantle and all it stood for in protecting life and the universe. However, during an expedition to Path Kafona, the forerunners would uncover a terrifying concept, one that would lead into a war that symbolized the hatred the forerunners felt towards their creators, towards the precursors. They would find out about the planned extermination of their race 
and that the precursors were willing to commit to genocide in order to preserve whatever their interpretation of the mantle was to be, which was said to be so complex that lesser species would not be able to comprehend the information being stored. However, in the eyes of the forerunners, to allow genocide would not be upholding the mantle of responsibility. It would be acting against it, as their interpretation was that whomever holds the mantle will assume guardianship of all life. The mantle shelters all, and they would also find out about their plans to assess humanity's potential. These revelations deeply angered the forerunners, who quickly had turned against the ones who had brought them into existence and had taken up arms against them, attacking with such fury, such hatred, such anger towards them. The precursors would be initially shocked and stunned by the conflict, but also would marvel at it. Perhaps they would not just be stunned and shocked or marveling at the conflict, but also shocked to see that they did not have the foresight in seeing this as a possibility. However, this would not matter for too long, as the Forerunners successfully pushed through their territories and continued to annihilate them, exterminating the Precursors for their transgressions against them, but not just against them, but against the Mantle. The Forerunners had quickly diminished the ranks of the Precursors, exterminating all who appeared before them driving them out of the Milky Way and eventually past the satellite galaxy of Path Kafona. The Forerunners would be successful in their plan to destroy the ones that they called the greatest threat in the universe, driving the Precursors to near extinction. The Forerunners had defeated them and had claimed the mantle of responsibility for themselves. However, they had done much more than just securing their future existence. They had unwittingly saved other species from failing the precursors and suffering the same fate as the forerunners would have if not for their intervention. However, little did they know that a small group of precursors had survived the initial slaughter and would reshape into a new form, grinding themselves down into a molecular dust or powder with others retreating into suspended animation within a capsule in an effort to escape the carnage and to hopefully be forgotten about. However, the Precursors would never forget what had been done to them and would always remember the Forerunners. Instead of patting themselves on the back for such a victory, the Forerunners who were blinded by their anger, by their rash actions, would end their own lives. Perhaps they felt they had gone against the mantle themselves and had deemed themselves not worthy of basking within its glory, within its presence. However, even with all of this, the rest of the Forerunner race would claim the domain for themselves. They would find that the domain was a collective of intelligence and experiences that could only be accessed by adults because only these age groups would be able to comprehend the knowledge bestowed within. It was all neurophysical, so that meant the users would feel as if entering a dreamlike state when accessing it. But not just this, but the knowledge held within would wane over time, like the minds of the ones who would access it. The rest of the Forerunner race, however, would lose all contact with the ones that pursued the precursors due to the suicides and the fleets that had pursued would slowly fade into legends and myths. At the time of 1,100,000 BCE, ancient humanity would achieve the ability to travel beyond the reaches of their native world. 
and into the heavens to travel among the stars in search of new worlds to claim for their own, for their own growing civilization, to build their empire. However, within the Path Kafona galaxy, a forerunner known as the Boundless would begin to study a star against the warrior's orders to disengage against it, where she would eventually be captured and prosecuted for these transgressions, where she would be forced into a cryptum to await inside for a thousand years as punishment for her crimes. However, a thousand years would pass and the once sealed cryptum would be reopened only for the forerunners to see that their prisoner had escaped, leaving her body behind as she passed into the next world. Shocked by these grisly turn of events, the forerunners would investigate to find that the cryptum had malfunctioned, possibly sabotaged and tampered with, to allow the peace of death to wash over the boundless. This case would forever remain unsolved, and so the forerunners would again move onwards despite of all of this. The human's exploration within 150,000 BCE proves to be a fruitful one as they continue to expand their territories across to the galactic arm and the forerunners would believe this to be an effort to escape them and their control. At this time, the forerunners would become the dominating forces in the entire galaxy. However, they would not be perfect as there would be those of their own kind that would disagree and a few civil wars would break out within their own ranks, following a stellar engineering accident that forces them to leave their home world in which a supernova of their sun was caused, burning the place they once called home, keeping the forerunners from pursuing and forcing their imperial ideology among them, among the humans, which was a good thing as humanity would be going through their own issues, which would push them into a space-faring dark age and large scales of their records would be lost due to these issues. However, they would soon build new bridges to create alliances with the race known as the Sang Chayum and would also make the former precursor world known as Charim Hakor their capital so that they could become closer to one of the greatest collections of precursor structures so that they could begin studying them more efficiently. 27,555 years later, Malfrillion, the capital of the forerunner Ecumene, would be constructed which would serve to be the center of their politics, which would be well defended and would exceed the scale of the future Halo installations. The huge station was constructed around a precursor construct known as Abandon, which was a powerful intelligence linked within the domain. 11,483 years later, Faber of Will and Might would be born, who would soon rise to power after claiming the title of Master Builder. 707 years later, Shadow of Sundered Star, later known as the Ur Didact, would be born, who would too rise to power within the years to come. 2,810 years later, human colonists would find the remains of crashed vessels and as they cracked them open and searched the contents held within, they would find something, something that would prove to be their undoing. Ancient humanity had found an organic powder that they would gather up and send to be researched by the scientists. They would continue to find more and more of this powder throughout the inhabited and deserted worlds within the Milky Way galaxy. However, the scientists would administer the powder to the animals known as the Feru, which had begun to make the domesticated animals more docile and submissive within their behavioral tests. The scientists believing that the powder was harmless started to keep the Feru as pets, and the Sang Shayum would do the same, believing that the companionship would enhance their lives. However, unknowingly, they were exposing themselves to a great danger, extinction levels of danger, as the powder did more than just make the Feru more docile and submissive. 
it had begun to make changes to its genetic makeup, as the powder was the remains of the precursors who had changed to this form ages prior, but as they tried to change back, they found it to be their greatest challenge yet. This was because the powder over time had corrupted, trapping them within this organic form, within the organic powder itself, which would prove to bring about the universe's greatest evil yet. Over the centuries, the changes to the Faru had begun to become more apparent, with growths appearing over the skin and fur, but the appearances would also come with changes to their behaviour, becoming more aggressive towards others. They would slowly mutate into something new and would cannibalise the other Faru present. And because the Faru were so widespread through human and Sang Shayun worlds, the sickness would transfer over to them, allowing Feru, humans, and San Shayums to become one dominant force, with one mind, one thought, and one voice. Within a timeless chorus, the flood had begun, and all were hopeless to stop them, as first came the feral stage. The flood would attack like a group of mindless monsters, poised to recruit more and more, turning the several worlds within their empire to their knees. Within days, if not hours, supplying the Flood with an ample amount of biomass, which they would make use of very quickly, creating the first of many proto-grave mines, which can be seen to be a parallel to the domain, as within these grave mines would be the collective to assimilate and absorb key intelligent minds to be used by the Flood's main forces, allowing them to use vehicles, weapons, and ships to pursue and force more to join the Endless Chorus. However, humanity would not give in so easily. They would defend these worlds vigilantly, trying to save as many as they could. However, the parasitic nature of this infection would prove to be too great, with those who fought to save the civilians from the hunger of the Flood becoming prey to them, or with them fleeing the worlds entirely. The Flood, like humanity, would not give up so easily, and would use the collective knowledge from their collection of grave minds to take to the stars and to pursue them, starting the Flood-Human War. Finding that their efforts to destroy the Flood were futile, and with the Flood never tiring, needing no sustenance to support them, only feeling the hunger for more and more. The ancient humans and Sang Shayums joined together and fled their territories, moving into Forerunner space in a desperate attempt to outrun the Parasite. With the Flood pursuing the ancient humans and Sang Shayum, they would also divide their forces in an effort to get ahead of the humans, so they would have nowhere to run. Meanwhile, the Forerunners would bear witness to an attack coming from the human fleet. Within the hologram recording, the Liberian shows that the humans had openly scanned the ship for what they assumed to be life forms. In the grand scope of things, they were scanning for Flood, and after she shows the consequences following the scan, she would suggest that they eradicate the humans for their folly. The didact, however, would suggest something more constructive within the council chambers, stating, Shall we take revenge? Abandon the mantle, and all of its philosophy has given us these thousand generations? The Liberian would state that all of their plans have been torn asunder, 
and the didact would state that they should defeat the enemy they have, sending them home, that they need to learn to stand with the galaxy rather than rail against it. With the crowds showing their support through the cheers, the master builder would show his support, and so would the librarian. The didact would soon leave for Requiem to meet with the sub-faction known as the Prometheans, who he had sent there prior to the meeting to save time, as he knew the Master Builder would side with him. Once there, he would call his dearly beloved Liberian, giving his farewell, but leaving her with his word that he shall return to her side once more. However, as they were given this exchange, the ancient human fleet had arrived above a planet within the Forerunner territories. As they begin their orbit, they begin scanning the world for flood traces. With the scans taking longer, the Lord of Admirals begins to see a glimmer of hope in the horizon of the planet, only for the scan to return with a positive trace, showing the infestation. However, the humans saw that the flood was slowly spreading in a remote location of their world. But as an assistant asked about warning the Forerunners, the Lord of Admirals would state that if they take the time to warn them about the flood, then the parasite would spread even further, making the task of eliminating the infection that much harder and giving them an opportunity to become stronger. The Lord of Admirals orders that the planet and all of the inhabitants are to be cleansed, killing all who dwell on the surface, which would serve to be the catalyst for the human Forerunner War. The war would last for a thousand years in which the Lord of Admirals would become the Didact's greatest and in his own words his finest opponent in the realm of battle. However, the Forerunners would utilize certain strategies in an effort to contain the amount of resources being used up. These would include jumping to major settlements and planets that were vital to humanity's war effort, skipping the less important planets. However, this would lead humanity into becoming more desperate with their Sang Chayum allies helping in the conflicts. The scientists would break down Forerunner technologies and re-engineer them to serve their needs in the war effort, allowing humanity and the San Shayum to hold off the Forerunner's advancements for longer than expected, bridging the technological gap between the factions that much closer together. The war would cast countless battles across the galaxy, bathing the worlds with both human and Forerunner blood. Streams of energy burning through the skies and through the cosmos, with only burning wreckage to litter the worlds and the galaxy, like a graveyard of lost ships, with all of the souls on board dead. The humans would defend their worlds against the Flood while also pushing into the Forerunner spaces with the aid of their allies. They would put up a considerable effort in fighting the war, dominating the battlefields, until the Prometheans would eventually outsmart them. The corridors and decks of ships would be filled with the sounds of energy weapons, firing streams of light. The sounds of humans and forerunners crying out in pain as these bolts had penetrated their armor and punctured through their skin and bones. The didact would commend humanity for their warrior-like ways, almost admiring their spirit in the war effort. However, he would also have a burning desire to seek an end to the conflict, which as said previously would lead him into more strategies that laid heavily upon that. However, this would come later on into the war, with their resources under heavy strain between two enemies, one that would fight the two sides with absolute anger and hatred for their cleansings, with the flames of war symbolizing this and an enemy that sought to devour their bodies, minds, and souls, that would never relent and were always ready to fight and assimilate. The humans would be in a critical situation when they would task scientists with a way to combat the flood, with most experiments failing in providing the war effort with something, anything, that could help them. The humans would implant a third of their overall population with genes that would target and destroy flood cells, sacrificing them 
for the greater good. At this time, the Forerunners would encounter flood-infested worlds and sterilize them alone. And so too would the humans, but not as a joint effort. In the years to come, the Flood would begin to retreat to far out space, to worlds far from the conflict, which led the humans into believing that they had finally defeated them. And so too would the Forerunners believing that humanity had found a cure for the Parasite. However, blinded by their hatred for them, the Forerunners would continue the war with the humans and their allies. Nearing the end to the war, the humans would send colonists to a ravaged part of the Milky Way. However, when they arrived there, they would find something ancient that held a terrible truth. The scientists would eventually find a way to communicate with the Precursor and would present the Primordial with questions about the Flood, to which of these the Entity would reply in graphic detail. These answers would disturb and traumatize the humans so aggressively that the ones who heard the answers would end their own lives, which would contribute to humanity's downfall in the years to come. However, the scientists also were able to seize Forerunner technologies, which would continue to aid in the war effort throughout this era. Despite humanity's heavy losses, they surprisingly fared very well against the two sides and would have nearly defeated the Forerunners if not for the Didact and his Promethians that would seal the humans and Sang Chayum's fate within the war leading into their ultimate demise, which would conclude 90 years later as the Didact and his forces would push humanity back to the Charim Hakor system, which was said to be the core of their empire, which would be under siege for the next 50 years with the Sang Chayun being cut off from them, forcing humanity to take their last stand until humanity's defences had finally been broken, which allowed for the Didact to have an audience with the remaining leaders and one of the Lord of Admirals, where the Didact would capture the political leaders and take them to be processed and later composed, preserving their memories and essence. As for the rest of humanity, the Didact would allow them to answer for their part to play in the destruction of Forerunner territories, and as the Didact would state to the Lord of Admirals, the killer of their children, he would force a state of de-evolution upon them, stripping them of their interstellar status within the universe and reverting their civilization back to the tribal period of their history. Instead of high energy technologies, they would now have to hunt and forage for food, struggling to stay warm in the harsh winters. The humans would be relocated to their home world of Earth at this time. Following the battle, the Didact and a group of Prometheans had gained access to the Primordial. The Didact would believe the Precursor to be a hoax, nothing more than a psychological weapon created by the humans to demoralize the Forerunners. However, upon some exchanges made between the two, it was confirmed to be one or the last of its kind. The Didact would seal it away within the Time Lock prison and leave the planet. The Liberian would claim that the remnants of humanity are to be safe, that they would rise once more under her careful tending. She would then conduct her own investigation into humanity's rather rash behavior and would become more sympathetic towards their fears and struggles they had to face in the years before the conflicts with her own species. She would theorize to her husband, the Didact, that she believed that the humans were never attacking and aggressively expanding upon their territories, but were instead running away from the flood and their onslaught, that when humans started attacking their planets, they weren't really attacking them, but rather were instead acting as caretakers for the galaxy, perhaps in an effort to right their mistakes, protecting others from the horrors they were forced to face. 
The Diadax, blinded by his rage, would deflect these theories away and claim that the humans took the mantle into their own hands, and in doing so, they brought the sickness to their doors without cause to do so. So the mantle belongs to the Forerunners, and Forerunners alone. Which would cause the Liberian to state that, yes, they do hold the mantle, and they hold it so tightly that even in death, no other would be able to assume that role as guardianship for the galaxy or the universe. Following the warfare and the resetting of humanity, the Didact and the Master Builder would begin designing a stronger defense system that would soon become the sole entity to govern and control all of their world's defenses along with the surrounding fleets. The AI that would control all of this would be known as Mendicant Bias. The reason for all of this was to be in the case of the Parasite's return, to have some contingency plans in order. Forerunner scientists would attempt to use the composer to digitize test subjects, which if successful, would make them all immortal. However, once tested, the personalities of these digitized forerunners would fragment and become shells of themselves. When the scientists deemed the tests to be failures, they would attempt to give them back their physical forms. However, once they would do this, they would return, but as abominations of their former selves. The Forerunners would continue to make advancements within the composer's capabilities. However, the test subjects would either be composed again, or put down. Through the centuries, the Forerunners would continue their talks and advancement into higher forms of technology, and this would be the time that Master Builder Faber would commission the construction for an installation that would come to be known as the Greater Ark. The installation would look like a flower, with the center being a round shape with petals that would stretch outward away from the center. The installation would be similar to the shield worlds, with it looking to be a station from afar, but upon closer inspection, there would be another world inside of the installation, one that held its own atmosphere, allowing those who dwell on the surface to breathe without the use of masks or helmets. This would be the great foundry of the several Halo installations that would be debated on through this time, and this installation would be the very presentation that would win the long debate, that the Forerunners should construct these rings just in case the Parasite were to return in the future, as the Forerunners were wise enough to see that dropping their guard would indeed be foolish, especially straight after a 1000 year war that destroyed the lives of billions despite the cause and effect the Flood had on the humans and their alliances. The Halo Rings would be installations that would be similar to the Ark and the Greater Ark, however they would house more destructive and productive uses that would all be made clear in the millennia to come. The year is now 100,040 BCE, 6,405 years since we last looked through the veil of reality. In the time of peace, the Forerunners would continue their strides into advancing their technologies, with the help of the Domain, of course. 
The forerunners at this time had been designing and developing a new type of ship that would come to be known in the future as the Dreadnoughts of the Forerunner fleet. However, little did they know that an old enemy was planning to fulfill their long desires to get revenge on them in the most disturbing way possible, adding them to the timeless chorus of conjoined species, all bound by one voice and one collective mind. The Flood at this time had not been beaten, but were secretly binding their time, playing the long game, waiting for the Forerunners to drop their guard finally, which would be the prime time to strike bringing in fear back to them, back to their civilization. Within the years to come, the overall threat of the Flood during the human forerun of war would lead to the rise of the corrupt builders who would be led by the Master Builder. Faber would propose constructing the Halo Array so that if a parasite would ever return, then they would have a better chance against them and would fare better than humanity. The Didact would continue to protest against these ideas as he believed using such a weapon would act against the mantle. However, these debates would continue into the next thousands of years. Master Builder Faber would eventually win the long debate with the council about the construction for the Halo Array, and construction would start soon. However, the Promethean faction would be forced out of the council, many of which would be disgraced and executed due to the Didact's inability to support Faber's victory, as he wished to continue with Shield Worlds, and when the council demanded that he support the Master Builder in constructing the array and forgo the shield worlds, he would disobey. This decision would lead into the dismantling of the Prometheans and the warrior class, diminishing their role within their civilization, where many of the Prometheans would be executed, others chose to be exiled, to be kept within a cryptum for 1000 years, following their lord and master, the Eurydidact as he too would be forced into a cryptum that was set to be placed on the planet of Nom Drago, where he could meditate on his past actions, conflicts and disagreements, and only when his sentence was to be fulfilled, only then would he be welcomed back into their civilization. During his last meal with the Liberian, however, the Didact expressed hope in her abilities of foresight and hoped the humans under her care would not disappoint her. Near the jungle of Janjor Quam, the fortress class vessel the Deep Reverence would be set for retirement, which the Confirmer would be tasked with looking after the ship. The Confirmer was an old Promethean who mentored the Didact who was also the commander for the vessel in question. As the final obstruction was removed from office within the council chambers, the Master Builder Faber would commission the construction of the Halo Array. With the guild of Bornstella's father, he would start to build the original 12 rings. It is here that a forerunner known as Growth Through Trial of Change would decide on becoming a life worker like the Liberian, instead of remaining as a builder. However, because of this change, her family would reject her and she would be cast out, but as luck would have it, a new family would foster her so that she may start her new great journey. 50 years into the Didact's sentence, the Liberian would undertake a mission of her own in the absence of her husband, to study the origins of the Flood in the satellite galaxy of Path Cafona, so that she could please the Master Builder, who now saw her as a liability, so she would travel to this part of the universe to show herself as a valuable asset to Faber. She would take a crew of seven with her, 
including a builder named Keeper of Tools, a miner named Clearance of Old Forests, and two life workers named Chant to Green and Birth to Light. Within the system, they would find networks of precursor star roads, which were neural-based megastructures that precursors would have used to traverse through space, along with tethering worlds together. The Liberian would also find a population of prehistoric forerunners on one of the planets after their scans. This is where the truth is revealed to them about their past transgressions and their dealings with the precursors that they may not have been planning the forerunners extinction and jealousy could have played a role in the destruction of the gods themselves. As you see, the victors are the ones who may tell the story, whether that be how the events actually played out or manipulate the events to make the story easier to hear, to victimize those who really were the villains in this story. Or in this case, the lie the next generation of Forerunner believed would be that they were destroying an evil that saw fit to claim their existence, provoking a response from them in the worst way possible. However, she would keep these discoveries and truths to herself out of fear of the Council's reaction, as this would only make things worse in her overall current situation. She would also discover precursors that had taken up refuge in this world, in the form of floral plants. Unlike the primordial, these forms were in the forms of beauty, bright and clean entities, while the primordial was fueled by misery, violence, who relinquished in causing pain and death. A parallel between God and the devil, the Liberian and her life workers would encode these specimens and she would soon take these forms home with her for further study. Stretching another 650 years into the future, the Didact and his surviving Promethean faction would only have another 300 years in their exile. However, the Forerunners would soon have need of him and his capabilities in the realm of warfare, and the Didact would not have long to wait until the pressure would get to them, as an old enemy had been festering in the long game. As a Forerunner pioneer group was searching for new worlds that could be suitable for their growing empire, they would soon come across a planet known as Seaward. In their analysis, they would find that the planet was most promising, however they found it hard to imagine why this rich and vibrant world had no life in sight or at least intelligent life. The Forerunners began to colonize this world, and so would the tale of Soma the painter begin, as she was about to begin painting a picture with the use of her self-painting jet brush that could sense color from its lens. Whatever it could see, it would paint. The event that she was waiting for was called Two Fire, an optical effect caused by the light from two suns passing under the horizon and reflecting on scattered clouds above. It was beautiful, and she was trying to capture it in real time, spraying smart pigments onto a glass surface. However, as it was doing this, the blinding light coming from the two suns collision would cause Somia to shield her eyes the jet brush would capture something off within the beautiful environment. As the light faded, she would look to her glass canvas to see all that was to be expected, but something had caught her attention. Within the painting, a dark grey streak, a dirty charcoal imperfection drawn through the center of the other hues in a floundering arc trailing a sickly yellow smoke behind it. Looking up to the sky, she would then see it, the smoke hovering there, 
like something up above was casting a shadow. Disturbed by this, she would pack up her things, fearing the worst. She ran back down to the settlement to inform her superiors, and they would see that their worst fears had been realized. They would send instructions to inform the didact. It was back. They were back. The flood had returned. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of disease and chaos upon your world, to twist all flesh to my will, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the name of Forerunner shall die, and be reborn everlasting. The parasite would successfully launch their first strike, consuming every morsel of intelligence and biomass it had to offer, almost savouring the taste of it, turning the once beautiful scenes and sights into a world of flood, with the once beautiful skies turning into a green haze filled with flood spores that would infect anything that would breathe them in. The plants and wildlife turned into flood hives, with the dens constructed from the bodies of the fallen. The world of Seaward would be only the tip of the iceberg, as the flood would leave the world in search of the precursor's unified revenge, taking us into the flood forerunner war that would end 99% of life within the galaxy. The Forerunners would try anything to get a foothold within the war with the Parasite, including using the Composer to strip the Flood forms of their physical selves. However, when they would attempt to transmute them into another form, they would find that the infected would be fine for a short period of time, until the bodies of these constructs would start to rot and fall apart, giving the Forerunners a terrifying concept to overcome. That the Flood doesn't just take your body when it infects you, but it also takes your mind and your very soul, twisting all to their will. They would take several humans from their homes, taking them from their rather peaceful, loving and warm settlements into the cold and metallic corridors moving through brightly lit areas, then through darkened ones, back and forth between the two, until reaching the center of the complexes where experimentation would take place. The Forerunners, in their desperation, would experiment on ancient humanity in an effort to find out what the cure for the Flood was meant to be, and if they could engineer a way to defeat the Flood. 250 years into the war, the Halo Arrays are finally constructed, and the Forerunner Ecumen Council assigns Mendicant Bias the task of testing the seventh installation that was in position near Charim Hakor. The test fire would be a complete success, wiping out all life that possessed a nervous system. However, in doing so, they had in fact done the Flood a huge favour, as the system-wide blast had freed 
the primordial from the time lock prison. Upon this discovery, the master builder Faber would order that the primordial be transported to the ring to be interrogated. Faber would then assign that task onto mendicant bias, which seemed to be an optimal move at the time. However, they would soon come to know of why that would not be the case in the future, as the Flood had more tricks up their tentacle riddled sleeves than just simply infecting and twisting corpses to their will. Installation 07 would then enter slipspace to an unknown destination where the two would have their long discussion about the Flood and of the Forerunners. The Librarian at this time would return to Earth to index the human species, but she came with a surprise for the natives. Here she would bring the Didax prison to be away from the Master Builder's prying influence within the Council. She would leave and take the samples to be stored on the Ark. Furthermore, she would continue her researches into the Flood. However, thanks to the efforts of a young forerunner known to be Manipula, who had travelled to Earth in search of relics of the past, had accidentally stumbled upon the Didax Cryptum and accidentally released him from his prison. The Awakening would summon fleets of forerunner ships to Earth, however when they had arrived, they could not pinpoint his precise location. The Didact was on the loose and would pilot a ship constructed from a design seed with two humans accompanying him on his travels. Seeking to answer what has happened in his absence, he would travel to Charim Hakor to find that the Primordial had escaped from his prison. But something was to be found on this hollow shell as Chakus and Ryza, the two humans that had travelled here with the Didact, would start to relive memories of the past, which were imprinted on them by the Liberian. The Didact would take the humans off-world and to the San Shayum system in order to see if more memories could be unlocked, which was still held under quarantine by the Forerunners for their part to play in the war between the humans and Forerunners alike. The Didact would allow for a brevet mutation on Manipula so that he could access the domain, which in turn transferred part of his consciousness along with all of his memories and knowledge into Manipula's mind, which would lay dormant within him. This is where they would encounter the Confirmer on the Deep Reverence in order to gain access to the restriction. However, in a cruel twist of fate, the Didact and his companions would be captured, interrogated by the Master Builder's forces. However, even after refusing to give up the codes for the Shield Worlds, Faber had let the Didact live, but would exile him along with a group of forerunners inside of a ship that held stasis bubbles, where he would live out the rest of his sentence in a ship that would be left to drift out into deep space. The Liberian would believe that her husband had been executed as did the rest of the Forerunner race. Meanwhile, the personality and memories would awaken within Manipula, which had turned him into a near copy and he would be charged with taking control with the war effort, becoming the Isodidact, Supreme Commander, in order to combat the growing threat of the Flood. Over the years of burning the parasite from leeching new worlds, the Primordial would install the Logic Plague into Mendicant Bias, converting it to the Flood side, convincing the construct that the Forerunners were in the wrong and were standing in the way of the divine destiny of the universe and would need to be eradicated. This would slowly push Mendicant to feel hatred for his creators and would pledge itself to the primordial of the Flood. 
At this time, the Sang Shayun began to rebel against the forerunners, and Faber, the master builder, would use a second halo to sterilize their home world. However, he would soon notice that Installation 07 and Mendicant Bias had disappeared from his control, and so he would search for it, desperately trying to relocate its position. The council would become enraged of the misuse of the Halo Array, stating that doing this was to go against the mantle, and so Faber was to be held to answer for this in court. The remaining Halos were to be transported to the capital, with a decision to be made by the council to dismantle and decommission them. In the middle of the trial, however, Mendicant Bias would return with the missing installation. The rampant construct would use its authority to disable all security constructs and protocols. It would then override the council's armor, rendering their movements useless, effectively holding the Ecumene hostage. However, there was something Mendicant never saw coming, the Isodidact. Using his memories implanted into him, Born Stellar would use a fail-safe code to temporarily shut down Bias, releasing the Council and all of the defenses allowing them to retaliate towards the attack. Within the battle, Mendicant would reboot and attempt to gain control of the other Halo rings nearby. However, the Construct could only gain control of 5 of the 12 rings, with the others resisting greatly, and would attempt to enter a slipspace portal so that they could travel back to the Greater Ark. But in the heat of the battle, in combination with the stress caused by a recent slipspace jump, one of the rings would shatter, breaking into pieces. Sensing the danger of the defeat, the rogue construct would light Installation 07 with its energy weapon striking the Ecumene, causing significant damage to the capital. Installation 07 would then make a slipspace jump as per its failsafe protocol. In the case of a rogue construct, the ring will travel to a predetermined part of the galaxy to collide with a planet, which would destroy the ring. Mendicant, upon learning of this, would attempt to use humans and composed flood forms to try and override the systems. However, the Isodidact would intervene, shutting Mendicant down, which would lead into the rogue construct's capture, which would later be dismantled, and the builders would attempt to correct the rampancy that had taken place. As for the Primordial, the Isodidact would have him be placed into a reverse stasis chamber, in which the Primordial would be asked many questions, with some answers being brief, and others being in more details. However, he would provide clarity to the Mantle, stating that the Forerunners were not worthy of upholding the Mantle, that the Precursors were going to present humanity with the Mantle which had led to their own destruction. The Primordio also would provide answers that implied that there was no real cure for the Flood. The true reason the Flood had retreated before the end of humanity's war with them was to make them drop their guard, allowing for their swift return stronger than ever. The Flood could also choose whether or not a living being was to be infected. This revelation had angered the Isodidact, so much so that he proceeded to fully activate the stasis chamber, making the primordial age over billions of years in the span of a few moments. Watching the form break down and shrivel up so quickly gave the Isodidact pleasure from watching the abomination perish. However, unknowingly he had done the primordial a kindness, a favour if you will as the body may perish, but the spirit will live on. As the primordial, in his transcendial form, had travelled far and wide in the search for the flood, but more importantly, the grave mind that commanded the scourge, and the primordial would fuse his spirit with the collective might of the flood, 
spelling a great peril for all who would stand before them. The forerunners would rip Mendicant apart and would struggle in their attempts to recover the rogue construct with all of their attempts failing. Mendicant Bias was truly lost to them, so the forerunners would take the fragments and scatter them through the galaxy. Following this, they would begin the construction of the Sentinels to help in combating the Flood, but most importantly to make sure that the Halos could not be turned against them again. They would build these machines to guard the Halos along with other installations. It would be at this time that the real Didact, the Ur Didact, was set to awaken deep within the Flood territory. As unknown to him, the ship had drifted into their territories, the stasis bubbles had ceased over the years of the war, the ship's systems had begun to malfunction and was rendered barely functional. However, the Urdidact would not be alone, as more of his Prometheans were present at his side. Together with the other present personnel on board, they would begin using their brute strength to break through the functional stasis fields to free the other captives. Once successful, the Urdidact would take the minimal control of the stricken ship it is here that they would catch a glimpse of some of the star roads that had been reactivated and were moving towards them at high speeds. The Didact would volunteer to stay the course and another known as Catalog would vow to stay with him as the others attempted an escape from his predicament before the ship was to be destroyed. However, the forerunner known to be Maker of Moons would give the Urdidact her armor as a sign of respect. The two would shortly be captured by the parasitic force and the Gravemind would have the Urdidact be placed in another stasis field. The Didact would recognize the intelligence of this creature to match that of the Primordial. Although this knowledge was not going to help him in his current situation, the Grave Mind would then begin to slowly peel back the layers of his mind, granting unbelievable methods of mental torture and torment, breaking down and twisting his mind with the greatest weapon of all, words. This would severely shake the Didact's sanity and morality, as the Grave Mind's efforts were not simply meant to break him, but to restructure his mind, to turn the greatest warrior of the Forerunners into the Flood's pawn, to unwittingly help in their universal conquest. After the work was done, the Flood, under the command of the Grave Mind, would release the Didact, allowing him to escape to an empty spacecraft that was to be sent to a sector that the Master Builder was salvaging ships in. Upon arrival, the Urdidact would deliver a message from the Grave Mind, taunting the Master Builder with the suffering of his family, who had been absorbed into the Flood's collective mass. The Urdidact took extreme pleasure in giving the message to his old enemy. Faber would present the Didact to the Council, however, they both would be deposed and further interrogations would take place, forcing the Urdidact to recount his experience with the Grave Mind, which would only further drive him into insanity. The Urdidact's privileges would then be restored, allowing him to return to Requiem, while the Isodidact would continue as the Supreme Commander taking to the battlefields. Throughout these times, the Urdidact would attempt to change his form to protect himself from flood infection. However, with all of his attempts, he would fail in preventing a possible infection. With desperation kicking in, the Prometheans would volunteer to sacrifice themselves to the composer's capabilities. Much to the Urdidact's surprise of the dedication of his followers, of his Prometheans, the Didact would go through with composing his faction into machines known as Promethean Knights. In a desperate attempt to combat the overwhelming odds, 
pitted against the Forerunners, they would soon rise to protect the galaxy and would travel to distant worlds to purge the parasite with the didact leading them in his new post-mutated form. However, even with the separated victory, the flood continued to spread faster than they could be cut down. The didact would then consider that his numbers were too few and that perhaps if he could expand his numbers, they could pose a significant threat to the flood. No to the grave mind in which the grave mind was scouring the universe in search for mendicant biases fragments in order to reconstruct the flood's former ally in which after some time it would be successful allowing mendicant to act in its revenge with mendicant bias being reactivated the forerunners would find this out the hard way and would create a new construct known as offensive bias in an effort to counteract the rogue constructs strategies on the battlefield in the final years of the war the monitors would be built with their personalities and traits coming from the ones who would assume these roles such as the human known as chakas being composed and implanted into a construct Chakas would be reborn, assuming the role of overseer and commander of the Sentinels on Installation 04. He would now be known as 343 Guilty Spark. There would be 14 monitors in total, with some being composed of personalities and traits derived from humans and forerunners alike, becoming the partnership that perhaps should have happened in the first place. A meeting would then be organized to be had between the Liberian, the Isodidact, and the Urdidact on Nom Drago to discuss what methods were needed to be had in order to defeat the Flood. However, these discussions would erupt into arguments, and as the arguments continued, Flood pods would then begin to rain from the sky, cutting the meeting short. The two didacts would race to their ships, soaring into orbit with the Liberian and the Isodidact retreating to the Greater Ark, which now held the Council. The Urdidact would follow in his flagship, the Mantle's approach. As they had arrived, the Urdidact prompted to stay aboard his ship, not even visiting the Ark when the Commander's emergency conference was to begin. The Liberian would visit her husband aboard his ship. However, she was very disturbed to see what he had become. Soon, the Greater Ark would come under attack from the Flood and the weaponized Star Roads. The Urdidak would choose not to partake in the defense and had left the battle to go to a Mega Halo to compose nearly the entire population of humanity. And so the didact would return to Requiem. In his absence, and despite the efforts made by offensive bias, the Greater Ark would fall, and the light of the Forerunners would nearly be snuffed out, with their forces declining rapidly. The Liberian would be in disbelief at what she was seeing. The humans she claimed to be safe under her tending, that they would rise again stronger and better than before, with only fragments of their existence floating around in the winds of the environment. The Urdidact would face her fury through a hologram call, stating that the humans composed forms will act as final payment for their crimes in bringing the flood to them. Now they have a chance to right their wrongs. It was to be a kindness that they did not deserve in his eyes. The Isodidact would begin the plans with the Master Builder Faber to start the final plan, seeing that a victory that involved fighting, combating the parasitic force of the Flood in open warfare was completely impossible now. They had no chance, they must activate the rings, while the Liberian would instruct her life workers to index the species imprints while she works on dealing with her husband in stopping his madness. Which, after some time, 
she would be successful in catching him off guard while he would be constructing the machines from the human's essence. She would shoot him twice with a Promethean rifle. This had knocked him out, allowing her to transport him into a cryptum within Requiem, further sealing him away once again to meditate within the domain, to think on his past actions and to reflect on what he had become. She would charge the Prometheans with guarding the Didact, turning their burning orange eyes into a blue calming hue. The Liberian would then seal the shield world shut, saving the Ur Didact from the genocidal plan to save the universe from the flood. She would then take the builders to Earth to construct a portal that would take those who would activate it to the Ark. She would contact the Isodidact as he made the final preparations to the master plan. He would attempt to send help to her, but she would decline, stating that she was there to construct a device that would aid humanity's journey, and that her presence would draw out the Flood to her location. The Flood, however, would catch wind of this plan and would attempt a last-ditch effort to stop the Forerunners from enacting their plan to fire the installations. The Isodidact would task Offensive Bias with protecting Installation 00, preventing Mendicant Bias from reaching the Ark. The battle would be long and the Flood's numbers defied all odds, but as the end was drawing near, the Isodidact, with the press of a button on the main controls, would fire the installation's firing mechanisms, charging the weapons. Mendicant Bias would offer the chance for Offensive to join it, in which Offensive denied the chance to serve the Flood, and shortly thereafter, the Halos would fire. The rings would unleash a burst of energy that was designed to target a specific target vector, that being the nervous system. The dark space would be enlightened by the white field travelling through it, destroying the creatures that possessed such nervous systems, like those the Flood had consumed and preyed upon. The light would travel through countless worlds, leaving the Flood forms immobilized destroying their food, their organic resource, leaving them for the vultures of time to mop them up. However, there was still life left within the galaxy. The Forerunners, including the Isodidact, had survived the Purge as he fired the installations from the Citadel of the Ark, surrounded by the survivors of the Greater Ark. However, there weren't that many. The Halo Rings had not only destroyed nearly all life in the galaxy, but all of the precursor technologies. With the Star Roads gone, and the Domain Core systems destroyed, the Erdidact would be trapped inside of his cryptum on Requiem, left to fester within his own insanity until he would be awoken in the future. The surviving Forerunners would aid in seeding the galaxy, overseeing the Sentinels and Monitors as they would complete this task. This would extend over centuries, however they would be successful. As for the Flood Forms lingering in the wilderness, the Sentinels and Forerunners would capture them for further study, but most importantly, containment. They would scatter the flood forms throughout the galaxy to be imprisoned on the rings within the new flood facilities, to be hidden away and forgotten about under the highest guard possible. The Forerunners would soon come across a species that had survived the initial purge, and they would be fearful of what the consequences would be if they were to allow them to continue as they could take full advantage of the power vacuum, so the Forerunners would invite them all to Installation 07. Once they had located it and had taken them to the Silent Auditorium for a parlay, however, for the greater good, it would be here where they would be imprisoned like the Flood, hidden, locked away, and soon forgotten about. Despondent Pyre would then tell the Grand Edict 
that she fears that she cannot do this alone and the commanding forerunner would tell her that she will not be alone and utters the words, offensive bias has been deployed. As for the betrayer, the rogue construct, mendicant bias, the forerunners would locate and capture him among the lifeless flood forms where they would take him to the Ark where he would be imprisoned and held to account for the lives taken by his hand, allowing the construct to live out the rest of its life in confinement, to reflect on its choices, to like the forerunners atone for their sins. With life beginning again and the flood taken care of, the forerunners soon saw their purpose in the galaxy had come to an end, believing that the flood had corrupted them, proving once and for all that they were in fact not worthy of upholding the mantle. The forerunners would exile themselves, pledging themselves to inaction within the lives of others, leaving the Milky Way in search of a new purpose, leaving the mantle behind for humanity to reclaim as the precursors had always intended. The story of the Forerunners is now at an end, however, the story for the receded species was just beginning. Their struggles, their conquests, their victories and defeats are all to come as the galaxy or the universe moves towards a new time, a new era, a new age of conflicts and inner struggles. What these will include? Only time will tell. However, one thing is for certain, the essence of the primordial is still out there and has its sights set on humanity and everything. We could only hope that if the flood escapes containment, then humanity will have the strength to defeat the parasite and if other species will help in that task or if they will flee to save themselves. Thank you for watching. I must say though, this video was incredibly challenging to create compared to Dead Space, but it was a fun challenge all the same. But in any regard, I hope that I have done you all proud and you have enjoyed your stay. If you did, then please hit the like button, comment your thoughts below and I look forward to hearing from you. Sign up to join the British Alliance today by subscribing and ringing in the notification bell for all updates whether those be new videos, live reports or updates with new posts. In any case, I hope I will see you all once more and remember to have a good one.